Welcome to the Creative Push. Today we have Rachel Kais. She is an artist and a hypnotist. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Sherry. It's great to see you. Tell us about how you got started and what you're doing now. I was born and raised in Wichita, Kansas. Kansas isn't known for its arts and culture, but I did have a very creative mother and I'll say father too. He's maybe just coming around to admitting it and becoming known as a writer by his neighbors for some posts that he He's been making about fishing and nature. My mother was working as a graphic designer and is an artist herself. And so she quit working after I was born. And I think that most of her creative thrust was transferred then to myself and my sisters who are also artists. We always had encouragement and some kind of project that she was giving us to work on. I have twin sisters and they're two years younger than me. They are also artists. One of them is a fiber artist, weaver and college professor. The other sister is also a talented artist currently working as a consultant in architecture. She used to work for the Art Institute of Chicago, but now she's curating careers of other artists. So as a child, what were your earliest interests with art? I'm the one that painted the whole time and messed up all the carpet in all the houses that we lived in. Yeah. <laughs> Cause you probably know me to be a very messy painter. Painting has always been my thing, um, painting and also writing. I really haven't changed. I did performing as well. I was in plays, I did acting. And when I was about 10, I saw my cousin in a play and I was a very shy child. So I thought, wow, if I could do that, then I wouldn't be shy. So I wanted to take theater lessons that led to taking singing lessons and then led to performing, which led to my interest in music. When I was 19, I was doing acting and I was in the professional company at the Children's Theater. My daughter was a year old and someone told me, oh, you'd be good on camera. So I got the only agent that Wichita, Kansas had. And I started doing auditions. There was a new TV channel called the Family Health Channel. I think it broadcast in four states. I um, watched Barbara Walters that morning to see what a interviewer did. I went in and did my best Barbara Walters. And I got my own show on the Family Health Channel called A Breath of Fresh Air. And I interviewed doctors and health professionals on respiratory ailments. I'd been raised with a lot of religious influence. So I was pretty good at following the rules. I just did what I thought a, the rules for a newscaster would be. And it, it worked for me. And it was a good job for a single mom. I, got, I made 50 bucks an hour and I had no idea kind of how great that was at the time. Every Wednesday, pre-recorded yeah. episodes of A Breath the fresh air would run. Tell mm -hmm. us about your time in Nashville. I moved there as an intern for Warner Chapel Music through Berkeley College of Music, where I had gone to college and dropped out. Within that first year after being intern, they offered me a job, which I was too young to understand was an incredible opportunity. I turned it down and they would hire me to do odd jobs through a temp agency. I did everything from make lampshades for fluorescent lighting to help install sound systems to do all these odd jobs. And my primary reason for wanting to do that instead of accept a full-time position was because I had a daughter in kindergarten and I didn't want to put her in daycare. I wanted to pick her up from school. So I was, for better or worse, organizing my life around that. And I also wanted to stay an artist. I'd made a pretty clear commitment when I had my daughter at age 18 and in my 18 year old mind, it was very important to me that she saw me follow my dream, follow my heart, follow my art. Sometimes I think as a younger person, I thought, okay, I have to be an artist, gotta be focused do one thing when really what's more natural for me is to actually do a lot of things and to be influenced by many things because I'm a curious person. I think that if I'd had a degree, I maybe would have explored more things or not felt hesitant in some cases to, mm -hmm. to explore what I wanted to explore or apply for a job or different things that I didn't do. So what part of California are you in now? I'm in Los Angeles. Oh, you are in I was kind of lucky. I was in school when the lockdown happened. And so actually it was a great chance for me to study and really learn something new. So I went to hypnotherapy school. I did spend a full year in a program and it was fantastic. What do you consider your big break in your career? I think what happened for me that was rare was that within a year of moving to Nashville as a very young woman, I think I was 23 or 24 at the time. With 
within that first year that I lived in Nashville as a very young woman, I say no to the real job. Warner Chapel then gave me the job of hanging awards in the hallway, hundreds of them. And I had to hang them on the, all these long hallways within a 16th of an inch from each other. I'm listening to the music and it's all country music. I don't even know what kind of music I was writing at the time. It was crossed between like Broadway and avant-garde and it wasn't even rock at that point. All I knew was that I was not writing anything that was going to sell anytime soon and I had a lot to learn. And so I was kind of freaking out because I'd moved my kindergartner to this town. I didn't know anyone. I you know, was meeting people at the publishing company, but not really knowing what I was going to do. I just knew I had a lot to learn. One of the songwriters, Kenny Lamb, recommended a book to me called Being Peace by Thich Nhat Hanh. And the main message in the book is breathe in and smile out. So that's what I started doing. I'm like, okay, I can do that while I hang these awards. I'll do my breathe in, smile out practice. So I was breathing in and smiling out while hanging these plaques just as a means of trying not to freak out. Like what, what happened? I've got this kindergartner and me here in Nashville and I don't <laughs> write songs that are going to sell. And I was smiling all the time as a result. And that must have made me approachable because that's how I started making friends. They would, the songwriters that would come in would just come up to me and start talking. And then one day, John Rich started talking with me and said, you're always smiling all the time. I only know one other person that does that. And his name is Big Kenny and you need to meet him. And so he brought me to a party so that I could meet Big Kenny. And then Kenny and I became friends. Really, he kind of big brothered me. He'd come check in on me and Whitney and come over and play songs with us. He's just he's a kind person. And I think he is enough older than me that he could see there was a, a young single mom and her kindergartner <laughs> on the loose that maybe needed a friend. <laughs> But through knowing them and Max Abrams, we started doing a jazz improv show. It was Max's show. And he asked me to help him come up with the concept, the things we would do, the artistic little moments that we would have in the middle of the music. And so we organized a show for a performance artist named Marvin Posey. And Marvin painted during that first jazz show that we did. I was the lovely assistant. I was a co MC with Max. Unfortunately, after that first show, Marvin Posey passed away. He oh. had a heart attack about a week after that show. And it had gone very well, the show, at least from our 24 year old perspective, we'd all made $300. As shocking as and sad as his death was, Max kept saying, you paint all the time, Rachel, you can do this. Why don't you just try it? So after a month or so, I think he finally convinced me to give it a try. I did. And it turned out that I don't know if I was good at it, but the pressure of painting in front of people and having a time limit forced me to complete a painting and paint in a new way. Once I started doing that, John and Kenny and some of the other people would come down and do spoken word or improv music, different styles of music at, at the jazz show. As these two gigs were happening, ours in Franklin and uh, Music Mafia in Nashville, John and Kenny got signed by Warner Brothers as the duo Big and Rich. They kind of absorbed me and Max and took us on the road with them as part of Music Mafia. I was working full time and it was a pretty wild ride really through 2009. We were touring nationally. We were in a lot of press and I was selling a lot of paintings. After the tours were over, it was a lot of random performances here and there. And then that led to also doing different events and things mm -hmm. on my own outside the Music Mafia. I think that that experience of touring with them and kind of being known as a member of the music mafia. It did open a lot of people heard about me and saw my art as a result. And I still have a client base because of those because days. Of I learned through people that were buying my work about abstract expressionism. I learned that what I was doing could be considered action painting. And I really got educated both by doing that many. I had done hundreds of those paintings during music. Mm -hmm. Anytime you do something again and again and again, you're going to learn something and it's going to change and you're right. going to get better at it. So right. I learned learned that that was really my education as a painter, both at exploration and education. But then some of the people that would see what I was doing or buy my work, they actually really helped to educate me too on what I was doing or how it fit into history or context of um, what it was. I was more on the breathe in, smile out, be yourself, express yourself. Who do I want my daughter to be? Well, I want her to be right. herself. So I'm going to be myself. And that was more where I was pretty unsophisticated in as an artist. And 
I probably still am in some ways. I go more for my intuition than I do for my, my mind when I'm painting. You relocated to LA and what was the reasoning behind moving? To- yeah, I kept on painting and I also started doing some consulting. I've really learned a lot and really enjoyed being around I don't know, a larger market of artists. And I think in LA, I've really established that studio practice mm-hmm. where it's more of an internal orientation to my work than I had before, which was more external, more performative. What are you working on now? I have a studio arts practice and a hypnotherapy practice. So what I am working on as my main project is to combine art and hypnosis slash hypnotherapy. What I've done is I created a series of paintings. I have 64 paintings. I may be cutting one of them out, but at least 63 paintings that I've made into an Oracle guidance deck created as like, I don't know if you've seen tarot or angel cards or things like that. I did it with um, lateral thinking prompts in mind, meaning like indirect thought process or creative to stimulate creative thought. So I took these 63 paintings. I brought myself into hypnosis, painted them in hypnosis, and each one is an abstraction of an inspirational word. And then I reinterpreted that word by looking at the painting without knowing what the word was to create the descriptions. And so it's all painted and written with the intention for people to take your issue or your idea about why you're going to pull a card out of the deck. And it's designed to stimulate a new way of thinking or looking at your query. Why hypnotherapy? What was your interest in that? I've had a very long time interest in thought, starting probably when I was around 19. Someone gave me a set of cassette tapes about positive thinking. That was very new to me at that age. And it took me years to kind of understand that, oh, I can choose my thoughts. I don't have to believe everything I was taught or told. That probably helped me a lot to have courage as an artist. It wasn't until years later that I really understood more what the subconscious mind was and how early experiences Mm -hmm. and early patterns of thoughts really affect our our lives. In my mid-30s, became aware that I had experienced anxiety for most of my life really since childhood and I didn't know and then I learned that it didn't have to be that way and so that really led me into the healing journey into alternative modalities as well as some psychotherapy and then through that as I was doing some uh, therapy for trauma I started adding in hypnotherapy and it, the healing was fast and the difference it made in my life was huge and I mean just really in my daily life and the way I was waking up feeling in my my thought processes, I finally decided to pursue it. I had a little hint, urge to bring hypnosis into a, a performance piece as an artist. And once I got into the program, into the school, I, had, I said, oh, I could use hypnosis in this performance piece like this. And then everyone could feel the benefit that I've been feeling, but I want to be really know what I'm doing. So I found an intensive program. Once I, I think about two months into the program, I was like, oh yeah, that art project was just an excuse. I just wanted to come study it. Can you explain your art style, your influences, and your technique? Art style. I'm going to say abstract or abstract expression. However, that gets canceled out sometimes because if you look at the music paintings, they're very literal. Picasso is one of the first artists I think a lot of people see, especially if you're coming from the Midwest. I was aware of Picasso's artwork and I liked it, but I never sat down and tried to copy it. I had a really good high school art teacher too, who taught us how to really look at things. You know, doing still lifes in his classes, we'd have one of the other students would like be the live model just sitting in the middle of a circle of desks. And and I learned how to look at things. And I started to see the shapes in, here's my I, my little triangle under my eye and my half circle shape. Where does the rest of that circle land in the body? I did look at how to draw the human body and the proportions and things, but then I also started to play with what the shapes are and how many different kinds of shapes you could put together. Or can I change that circle to a triangle? Or it was just kind of my own curiosity. What is creativity to you? I'm making things. It's not limited to a thing. Creativity is perspective because it could be creative 
perspective to say you've got a, a conflict. This is the conflict. It's this person said this and this person said that. Well, then go look at the conflict from someone else's perspective. That's a creative act, right? Yeah, I'm going to make a painting. That's creative. It wasn't there before. And then I put paint on the canvas and now it's there. That's creative. Uh, what inspires you to create? Say different things inspire me to create because sometimes I'm inspired by someone called and commissioned a painting and they want it to be this, to look kind of like this. So then I'm inspired to get the job done. In that, I'm looking for what that emotional really that's going to bring it to life for me. Other times with this series that I just did, I was inspired by the idea of creating visual lateral thinking prompts. And I really wanted to do that. And so it was then finding a process that worked for me. I was having a lot of fun feeling inspired the whole time. What do you do when you get stuck? Hypnotherapy. <laughs> <laughs> so you yeah. can actually hypnotize yourself? Yeah. Or I go to see a hypnotherapist, yeah, depending on how stuck I am. What would you like to learn that you haven't learned yet? There's so many things I want to learn. I'm learning energy work right now for healing purposes. I want to learn more about that. Tell me a little bit more about the project you're working on now. Is it available for people to see online? Is it something that people can purchase? The paintings are available to see online. I've sold one, but I haven't promoted it. And I'm getting all of that put together to start pre-selling the deck. I have my prototype right here. It's a deck of these cards. Here's the little, and then the paintings are on, on each card. You got dog, mustache. We would just keep going until you had a little series of words that told a story. We would look at those as coming from your associative mind. Then it would be to come to it really with an intention or a question or a thought or a, you know, a situation where you're looking for insight from yourself. And we'd get a collection of words and then see how that story relates to the intention that you brought to the cards. So they're each an abstraction of a word. This word was safety. And then there'll be a guidebook with a little description that goes along with that. Do you have any advice to other artists? Make things. <laughs> <laughs> the ways we think about art or about ourselves, our relationship to art, our identity. It goes on and on and on and on. And especially if you're doing an art career, so many more thoughts about it. Like, oh, well, if I do this kind of thing, then it could go there. And then it could, you know, I think the times when I've been more successful and happier was when I was thinking about really what it is that I'm creating. Am I inspired by this? Do I want to make this thing? Am I connected to it? And what's my relationship to it? And those are more productive questions than like, how can I get to this point? It's a little bit counterintuitive because to survive in life and business, we have to have a goal, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a delicate balance between having a goal and how far away that placing that goal somewhere where you don't have to think about it while you're creating the art. Right. How, did COVID affect your business? Did it affect your creative space? It was the first time I felt like I was in the same boat as a lot of other people. I didn't blame myself for it, which was new. Also, I didn't have a lot of commissions. So I started like, okay, what do I really want to paint? For me, it was, I feel almost guilty because I know so many people were suffering and are suffering and struggling through it. The pandemic landed in my life at a point in time when I was actually able to push a reset button on what I was doing and really get clear and get with myself. Do you like LA? Do you want to stay out there? I do like LA, but as with anywhere, I don't know if I will stay or not. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you, Sherry. And same to you. It was a real pleasure to talk with you and see you again. <laughs>